Cause you can bet your ass it's gonna be crawling with security. All on high alert. Let's move. In the previous episode, we had seen a cutaway to Heidegger talking to a few of his subordinates, um, Sinshinra guards, and they had mentioned that they had captured the third member of Avalanche. Now, uh, assuming that they're talking about Barrett, they had captured Barrett, and Heidegger said, let him go. Now, why the hell would Shinra want to do that, considering that he must know what they were planning on doing? Now, considering that they had actually gone and not only allowed Avalanche to wreck the first reactor, but they actually blew it up themselves, it seems as though they actually want Barrett to do what he's doing. They want Avalanche to go and blow some shit up. Hmm. Why the hell would they want to do that, considering how much those reactors must cost? And, well, blowing up Shinra stuff would probably, you know, suck for Shinra. But they seem to be willing to let it happen. Hell, I, I don't know why they want it. Anyway. You really don't like Stamp, do you, Barry? It's not that I hate it. I hate the fact that Shinra took a loyal animal like that and co-opted it for their own self-serving agenda. Poor old Stamp. Think you're making progress, and then you hit a wall. Knock it down. You're starting to sound like Barry. Never mind. It's a good plan. Hey, hold up. This way. Security is a lot tighter than I thought it would be. If they want to stand between us and the rail yard, that's their choice. Okay, I guess we hit the end of the line here. It's going to be a bit of a, well, let's call it a mini boss fight. Although they have even more of these little, little rooms along the side. I think any time that you encounter any sort of secondary passageway or or something sticking off to the side and if you're watching the mini map you can usually see these things come up you're gonna want to go and check it out because there's almost always going to be something there that you want now it's got these boxes which these boxes that you break up with the sword which i'm guessing are randomized as far as what comes out of them usually nothing sometimes it restores your health or your mp or it might be a potion it might be something good but you don't know until you try okay so it's kind of a mini boss now we have the flame troopers and the regular guards i guess but there's nothing too special about them but these, uh, these turrets, these missile turret things, which were an enemy in the original game, they popped up in the subway system, just like they are here. But they weren't supposed to be, like, they were just regular enemies, not something that's supposed to provide, like, being a mini-boss. But, you know, why the hell not? Now, even though they... Barrett and most of Avalanche, at least, seems to be okay with the idea of causing collateral damage. You know, the, they, they don't know, or at least Barrett doesn't know, that it wasn't their fault that the first reactor exploded the way it did. But he still seems to be, he's still willing to go ahead with it anyway. I'm going to extend that to them not really being overly concerned with the welfare of the guards that they are taking out. They are hurting and killing as they move through these things. I mean, these flame troopers are people, too. They may not be named characters or anything like that, but, but I mean, they are supposed to be people. And, well, how much can you really blame a person for being an employee of Shinra? I mean, Cloud used to be, um, assume that a lot of people used to be. Jesse's parents were, or maybe still are. Just because a person works for Shinra doesn't make them a bad person. So, well, how can you justify knowing that, go running around and just murdering all these people just to get through? Eh, I guess they, uh, <laughs> I guess they gotta do what they gotta do, huh? You can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs, and you can't be an eco-terrorist without willing, willing to at least hurt people a little bit. 
be a terrible terrorist if you are unwilling to hurt anyone. Not that I'm advocating any of that kind of stuff. If you go and examine the motivations, just to complicate that thought a little bit, if you examine the motivations of all the characters who are members of Avalanche, you have um, Barrett, who, well, it's not going to be, probably won't be discovered in this game, but his motivation is, of course, revenge for the destruction of his hometown. Tifa's same thing. Her hometown was destroyed, and that's her motivation for wanting to hit back at Shinra. Cloud, a little bit more complicated. Jesse, personal, uh, personal grudge with Shinra. Biggs and Wedge, I don't know. So, since they have a sort of a personal revenge, a desire for revenge, it makes kind of the argument against fighting Shinra and hurting people maybe a little bit less savory. If they're not really doing it for the sake of the planet, if they're doing it for the sake of themselves, and they're killing all these people to do it, complicates the issue a bit. We should be reaching that secret passage real soon. I knew Plan E wouldn't fail us. Should have called it Plan X. What you think, Mr. X Soldier? Biggs made the plan, right? I provided some input. Hope not too much. What's that supposed to mean? I also wonder when exactly they did make up this plan. They must it must have been their intention from before they bombed the first reactor that they were going to hit these things in rapid succession. I guess every couple of days they were gonna hit a new reactor. Even though after the first one you think it would probably get pretty hard to actually get into one of these damn things. So, if the initial plan was that, okay, they go and hit that first reactor, what was their plan if Cloud wasn't going to be there? The way I interpret the events leading up to this was they really only encountered Cloud. Tifa found Cloud at the train station. Spoiler, spoiler alert, by the way. Tifa found Cloud at the train station maybe like a day or two before they went on that first mission. Certainly not a long period of time. It's not lo so long or, or so short a period of time that even Jesse didn't know Cloud's name before, uh, before the mission started. So I guess maybe... And Cloud didn't even have anywhere to stay beforehand. So he just shows up. Maybe he was even that same day. Runs into Tifa. She brings him back to the bar. And, look, oh yeah, I'm a mercenary. Oh, oh you know what? We just so happen to need mercenaries. So what was their plan if Cloud hadn't shown up? Hmm. Moreover, this if she wasn't planning on... Why wasn't she planning on going on the first mission? And if she wasn't planning on going the first mission, but she was going to go on the second, why was that? What, what role was she fulfilling, other than maybe babysitting Marlene, that uh, you wouldn't uh, want her coming along? They're winging it, is what I'm saying. All these so-called, like, planned missions are just a bunch of idiots who are out for personal revenge that are just sort of winging it. Maybe they didn't even plan on hitting this one after a couple of days. They just got back. Barrett got excited and goes, Oh, let's hit another one, motherfuckers. So, that's what we're doing. <laughs> oh, man. Busting up the tables. Those things are expensive, Cloud. What are you doing? So many guards. Looking for faithful little Stan. He'll lead us to the passageway. Well, I don't know about you, but I recognize a battle arena when I see one. Of course, there's going to be something here. But let's get our special shit. Bust up all the things with the random goodies before we do that. Got to find the dog, too. This it? Huh? Hmm? Uh, get back! Uh, uh, what the? That all you got? Uh, Someone's mad. 
Take your bad shot, asshole! Now ain't this some shit. A full-on boss, not a mini-boss, and we're not finished with the dungeon. Huh. Now this, uh, Crab Warden, this is... I don't recall anything like this being in the original game, but, you know, it sort of follows the aesthetic of the kind of enemies that you saw in the original game. There was definitely no encounter like this at this point in the game, so... Hmm. Another boss that they added. Now, I wouldn't call this thing a mini-boss because, well, it's... The battle takes too damn long, is too involved, and is probably just too difficult to be considered a mini-boss. But it is definitely not all the way through this, uh... All the way through this dungeon. In fact, I figure we're, I guess, about a third of the way through this dungeon. So, we're not really, uh... Really, really not at the point where you would say that this was where you'd find a boss battle. Although it is the end of the subway portion. So if you're going to call that a... Uh, if you're going to go call that a dungeon in and of itself, and then you move on to another dungeon, then, okay, yeah, that makes sense. I think it's a bit of a weird way of looking at it, though, because, well, dungeons usually end at the end of whatever kind of threat that we're talking about here. We have, say, the first Mako Reactor in the original game. You get out of that, and you end up in some storyline sequences, and then you end up in the... you end up in the Sector 7 slums, a full town that you could buy some stuff, replenish the power, so power uh, items, and all that kind of stuff. And then you go on the second mission, and then after that, spoiler alert, you end up in the Sector uh, 5 slums, I think it was, where you encounter a town. See the pattern here. You have a town, dungeon. On the other side of that dungeon, you'll find a town. Then a dungeon. On the other side of that, you find a town. <laughs> They seem to be breaking with that tradition here, or that not so much tradition as is a uh, gameplay convention in this genre of games. I guess I, I understand why these dungeons are a lot longer, and you want to break them up a little bit between uh, between areas. So you're in, you have this long, you spend about 20 minutes going through this environment, and at the end of that, you're going to want some some kind of conclusion at the end of that. So, okay, so your conclusion is a boss battle. Not a mini-boss battle, but a straight-up boss battle. Then you move on to the next leg of the dungeon in a completely different environment. It looks different. Some of the gameplay is a little bit different. There was no town, but you're moving into another dungeon. And I guess they can get away with that thanks to those um, park benches and the and the item shops in the form of vending machines. They kind of make for little towns. I think you kind of... I mean, I guess it's worked so far in this game. I've played a little bit further ahead than this episode here. And I guess it, it does kind of work, although I feel like you have to be careful when going and doing something like that and messing with that convention too much because the towns do serve more than one purpose. It's not just a place for you to replenish your items. It's a place for the characters to rest, and more importantly, the players to rest. I had mentioned this probably half a dozen times in this series by now. At least I think I have. I can't really remember what I said. But there's this whole concept in literature that you don't want to have sort of high action, high energy more appropriate to say, more or high energy scenes constantly. You just go from high energy scene to high energy scene and you never have a point in which the story slows down. The story has to slow down in order for the reader or the viewer or the player to sort of rest up a little bit. Not that it actually makes them tired, but they'll get bored and they'll stop paying attention. You can't have... Oh, summoning. You can't have just non-stop action. It'll eventually get boring. So if you have crazy long dungeon, 
we have long dungeon followed by long dungeon followed by long dungeon and no real point where the player can feel kind of safe and the player can just sort of um, rest up a little bit or the player can f feel like they have a chance to take a breath you run the risk of wearing the player out now I think they do get away with this a little bit better here than they did in say 13 or Final Fantasy 13 because in 13 you never really had anything resembling a town to go into so because it felt like just a really long dungeon run it kind of wore on you and it's not a game that I can really play for long periods of time because I do kind of it does wear on wear me out a little bit I get bored of it that it? This game does eventually relent and give you that kind of rest period. It's kind of funny to think about it, though, because as a game and not just a work of fiction, they have to balance this on two different scales because you have the gameplay portions that you need a rest from, which is where the dungeons and then the, you go into the town for the rest. Then there's the story portions of the game where you're actually kind of going backwards with it where the story portions, oftentimes taking place in the towns or whatever, are the high-energy scenes, because you have... that's when all your character interactions and your development and all that kind of stuff tends to happen. And then you have the gameplay section, which uh, takes a step back from the heavy story, beat, beat after beat after beat, and giving you a chance to sort of rest with that. So you're constantly going back and forth between the idea of heavy story where it takes a rest gameplay wise and heavy gameplay where it takes a rest story wise and you can just sort of bounce back and forth between those two uh, to avoid falling into that pitfall I was talking about okay the crab warden is almost dead I they have these summon creatures in this game now summons have been a common thing in the Final Fantasy series for a long time and in the original game, they were just materia that you used it. It cost a lot of mana or MP. The monster appears, does one attack, disappears. And in this, it sticks around for a little while. Kind of like 13 did. All clear. And stay down. Let's go. Sure. Aye, right, this way. This won't do. Sir, analytics reports that the feed went down after an anomaly was registered during the test. An anomaly? Or an excuse for your failure to properly prepare the armor? No, sir. All modules were confirmed fully operational. It's far more likely, given the circumstances, that the sensors were overloaded Is that so? All the sensors in Section E are... inoperable. The President. Yes. Yes. Everything is fine, sir. Better, even. There's been a development. Yes. Understood, sir. We know exactly where they were headed. If the armor is intact, then you'd best determine the nature of this anomaly soon. <laughs> hmm. 
Should you fail to do so, you will deal with our intruders personally. Uh... Yes, sir. Don't worry. I treat my people more than fairly. So don't disappoint me. <laughs> the passage is beyond these shipping containers. Let's slip through them. Talk about a tight squeeze! You okay? Yeah. So, you bump into any giant robots like that in Reactor 1? Yeah, except a bastard looked like a scorpion. Speaking of which, what would you say that last one looked like? Huh? Uh, well... Hmm. Looks dead now. I assume that all of these narrow passageways that you have to squeeze through are just ways of slowing the player down so the game has enough time in the background to sort of load the next environment. I think they're implemented a little bit strangely because oftentimes the areas that you're squeezing through are in fact wide enough for the characters to fit through normally, especially Tifa, who's the smallest of the three. She doesn't seem like she had to even turn sideways to fit through everything. She could have just walked through. And even Barrett, though, seems like he shouldn't have had too much difficulty fitting through that. And there was an episode a few episodes ago where Cloud and Jesse and the other Avalanche losers were squeezing through this big, wide-ass area. But it seems like a progression gator. Slow you down. Let the game load. Just so you know, it's not going to get any easier. <laughs> when did it ever? and straight on to Reactor 5. You make it sound so simple. <laughs> Only because it is. <laughs> 